Okay, welcome everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the October, another October edition of the Liftoff webinar series brought to you by Lyft. Today we are happy to feature Quest Tech, uh, one of our uh, longtime Lyft members uh, who's going to talk to us about uh, the use of integrated computational materials engineering to resolve pressing materials challenges in industry. ICME is something that Lyft has been working on basically since our inception. So we're happy to have and proud to have members like Questech um, as part of our ecosystem who are working to, uh, to solve the same problems. So a few housekeeping issues before we get started. Uh, again, my name is Joe Steele. I'm the Director of Communications and Legislative Affairs with the Institute. Um, if you can uh, put your phones on mute or your computers on mute, that would be fantastic uh, as we can avoid any background noise during the presentation. We are recording this presentation, so for folks who couldn't join or folks who you think might be interested in it afterwards, you are more than happy to share it with them um, with them after the fact. Uh, also, uh, we will be having a Q&A session towards the end of the, uh, of the presentation. So if you use the chat function that is available on the Zoom uh, toolbar, uh, you can address those questions to me and I can facilitate the Q&A afterwards. Again, thank you very much for taking time to, uh, to join us today. I do want to take just a couple minutes before we get into Quest Tech uh, and their presentation to explain a little bit about Lyft. You may or may not know who we are and what we do, so I just want to give you a little bit of a, um, of a heads up on that. We are one of 15, now 16, National Manufacturing Innovation Institutes, uh, and our mission really is connecting the materials, processes, systems, and the talent to drive uh, rapid implementation of smarter manufacturing. Our goal is to drive American manufacturing into the future. So we are really where manufacturing technology and talent matter. In our Detroit facility, uh, 100,000 square feet, we have more than $50 million worth of R&D equipment that is available for use by our members and, and, um, and non-members, but we, you know, members, we prefer that we, you join us as a, uh, as a Lyft member. We also have a learning lab in the facility to, uh, to educate the next generation of, of manufacturing. So we are truly where manufacturing technology and talent, uh, and talent matter. So we look at the work we do as solving the manufacturing equation. I mentioned we are connecting the materials, processes, systems, uh, and talent. Um, and that combination is, uh, is, is the equation that we are working to solve through both of our programs at the Institute. We have our technology program, uh, which is leading innovations for tomorrow, in which we're taking, um, uh, we're taking uh, innovations from, uh, from concept to commercialization, really helping them cross the valley of death, um, across those MRLs, you know, four through seven, to where you've had some success in the lab and you, you think there's some promise there and really carry it uh, to industry and into the hands of the warfighter uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we also have our talent uh, side of the, of the business, which is learning innovations for tomorrow. I mentioned our Lyft Learning Lab. It is available uh, for use uh, pre-pandemic. You know, we had 150 students a day uh, in our facility learning uh, from us and through our Ignite Mastering Manufacturing curriculum that we helped uh, develop uh, with the Department of Defense to help, um, again, educate the next generation of advanced manufacturing uh, the advanced, the multi-skilled technicians, uh, and help open the eyes of, of students to, uh, to advanced manufacturing careers. Uh, as a National Manufacturing Innovation Institute, uh, we are a membership-based organization, as I mentioned. Uh, we uh, operate really in six different, uh, six different ways to the benefit of our ecosystem. We are a trusted advisor. Uh, we have experts both in-house and across our ecosystem in a wide variety of industries. So we're going to help guide people in the right way to help uh, move, their, uh, move their systems and, and processes into the future. We are a talent developer, as I mentioned. Uh, we're developing new venues like our Lyft Learning Lab that is not in a school. It's in a National Manufacturing Innovation Institute. Uh, we're developing new tools and new teaching techniques. To, uh, to try to make sure that our talent pipeline in manufacturing is, uh, is robust. Uh, we are a convener. Frankly, that's one of the reasons you guys are here today. Uh, we, are, um, uh, we are connected to the highest levels of the Department of Defense, government, and academia, and uh, we convene experts and, uh, uh, and interested uh, parties all the time 
to talk about how we're going to solve these major issues. Um, we have a technology showcase showing really the art of the possible in advanced manufacturing. If you visit our website at lift.technology, you'll be able to take a virtual tour of our facility and really see uh, the kind of work we can do and, and the kind of um, equipment that is available to you. It is, it is an evolving space, I'll tell you that much. You check, check back next year and it will look much, uh, much different, but uh, we are moving along with the times and into the future. So um, when, uh, when we get past this pandemic, we encourage all of you to, to stop by Detroit um, and visit us in person. But in the meantime, uh, please visit our website and, and take, that, uh, take that virtual tour. Um, we are a connector. We're connecting the needs and ideas and the people to help move the needle uh, in advanced manufacturing. So again, with our, with, our, uh, with our ecosystem of government, industry, and academia, we're able to, to point out and, and connect the dots uh, between the right people and the right organizations and the right ideas to help move the needle to, to take advanced manufacturing forward. And finally, in a, uh, a technology accelerator, also one of the reasons we are here today. Um, again, taking those technologies and those innovations across that valley of death to, uh, to, to commercialization into the marketplace and into the hands of the warfighter. Mentioned leading innovations for tomorrow. These are the four pillars of, uh, of focus that we work on. Uh, again, you'll see ICME is at the very top of the list, something we've been working on with our history of, of materials research. Um, so that is something we're very focused on and looking forward to hearing ICM, um, uh, Questech's ICME presentation today. Uh, we're also focused on agile and smarter manufacturing, the digital connectivity and the, the agility of, uh, of, of, of materials and processes uh, going forward. Uh, going back into our history, we have advanced alloy and process development and multi-material joining. We have some unique pieces of equipment in our facility that allows for multi-material joining or dissimilar material joining um, that you should, uh, you should take a look at. Um, not gonna get too deep into this, but uh, going a little bit further into those, those pillars, this is you know, where we really work on uh, our, our technology space. There's a lot of work going on, a wide variety of work going on, both at Lyft and throughout our ecosystem. You saw today, uh, we just announced that um, you know, part of this orphan obsolete parts that you're seeing, we were working with the US Army to take a look at some of the parts they have and see if they can be re-engineered or, or re, um, with, with, redone, with, remanufactured with new, new materials um, and new processes uh, because some of, those, um, some of those parts critical to their, to their services uh, are outdated and, and, and frankly can't be made anymore. Uh, learning innovations for tomorrow, the talent side of the business. As I mentioned, we have the Ignite Master, Mastering Manufacturing Curriculum. Um, mostly for, for high school students, um, uh, but they are learning each and every day, hands-on, um, virtually. Um, again, pre-pandemic, they were in the facility um, each and every day taking part in our, in our lab. The Lyft Learning Lab is the place where it is. It's really made up of seven unique labs. Uh, part of those labs include the world-class certification programs where we are, uh, have a welding and CNC training courses. We're soon to have robotics training courses as well, so folks can earn their certifications right there at Lyft. And finally, Operation Next, which is exciting. It is a program that we developed really for the military to help provide our men and women uh, that were in uniform the opportunity to earn a certification in advanced manufacturing um, before they leave the base. So as they're getting ready to leave, as they're looking for their next civilian career, we're offering them the opportunity to earn a credential in the, some of the highest demand advanced manufacturing jobs. And we're actually looking to, we're actually working on uh, rolling that out to industry uh, right now. Uh, thanks to a, a grant recently received, we're launching a program to help small and medium sized manufacturers train their workers in um, industrial technology maintenance, welding, robotics, uh, CNC machining in Detroit and, and in Pittsburgh as we recover from this pandemic. Again, there's more information on some of those learning innovations for tomorrow pieces here. So that is a, a, that is a quick nutshell about Lyft. I would encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn and, and Twitter. I would encourage you to, um, to visit our website uh, and contact us. If you have any questions, would like to join us as a member, learn more about membership, please do so. Um, and, uh, and again, thank you for joining us today, but enough about me uh, and, and more about uh, Questech. I'm going to hand the presentation off to Jeff and the Quest Tech team, 
and they can take it from here. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and they can take over. Off to you guys. Awesome, we can see your screen, but I'm not sure I can hear anyone. Okay, how about now? Now we can, now you're good. Okay, uh, thank you, Joe, for uh, the introduction. I'm Chris Kantner, and together with my colleague, Dana Frankel, I'll be, uh, uh, we'll be talking about uh, ICME and how Questec is using it to resolve some pressing material uh, challenges found in industry today. I'll start by giving a brief introduction to Questec, and then I'll talk about uh, ICME and the tools and philosophy of how Questec utilizes these uh, to solve industry challenges. And then we'll wrap up the presentation with three additive manufacturing case studies that showcase where we're using ICME today and where it's going into the future. So I'll start. Uh, Questec, we have been implementing a process structure property performance uh, relationship, understanding, prediction, uh, using a computational materials engineering approach for 23 years. Um, we augment that with advanced materials characterization techniques. Um, we have joint ventures in Europe and Japan, along with our um, home base in Evanston, Illinois, uh, right outside of Chicago. And we're proud to say that uh, we've been a Lyft member since, since its inception. Uh, as you can see across the bottom, uh, these are uh, examples of metallic systems that uh, we have or are currently working in. And then I've selected these two photos to really highlight kind of the breadth of where Questec operates. The above photo is an atom probe reconstruction of a ferrium steel that is really capturing the material on an atom by atom basis. So this speaks to the advanced material characterization that validates our ICME techniques. And then I'll take it to the opposite end of the length spectrum. Uh, the, the bottom picture is a component that is currently in service made of an ICME uh, designed and developed steel material from Questec. So really we're looking at a 10 to the ninth order of magnitude in length scale and uh, Questec operates across that length scale. Uh, currently, uh, where Questec is employing ICME solutions uh, within industry is really across the spectrum. While each of these challenging uh, applications is unique in their requirement, there is one thing that's consistent across any of these industries, and that is the need for new materials, new processes, that uh, reduce cost, enhance performance, and really are stretching the boundary beyond what traditional materials uh, can offer. So, and that's really where uh, Questec and this ICME approach really brings its value to whether it's uh, process optimization or specification optimization within an existing grade, to offering new materials that are cutting edge and offer performance that might not have been available 10 years ago. So to begin, I'll speak to the Questec philosophy of what it means ICME and what it means um, and how we go about using it. So underlying all of our ICME foundation is a physics-based mechanistic model to understand, describe, and predict key material relationships. So this is this processing structure property performance interplay that is uh, taught in just about all material science programs today. Uh, a bedrock of our technique is this calculated phase diagram approach or CALFAT approach that really allows us to predict uh, computationally a material microstructure. And from there, we're able to understand the interplay of processing steps and of how we will get to that microstructure and the impact that will have on the properties and subsequent performance. In addition to this CALFAT approach, we are continuously evolving as new techniques come out and uh, we're incorporating uh, some new computational techniques such as high throughput calculations 
and big data and machine learning to really complement this CalFAT approach. Because we use a mechanistic model, these uh, newer computational techniques really augment and complement this approach because we're able to extrapolate beyond what's known because the physics stay the same as we go into this uncharted territory. So we're not really interpolating between uh, existing goalposts, but we really are able to expand out beyond that. So the first thing we'll, we'll do is develop a roadmap uh, for this process structure property uh, for a given um, uh, development or design that captures the key aspects of the material microstructure and break it down into systems or subsystems that are very important for that uh, material microstructure. And then we provide linkages to either properties going to the right or the processing steps, which will help uh, determine what that structure is to the left. And each of these lines is representative of a model that we will look to uh, implement or develop so that we're able to predict how uh, various processing steps that are available uh, within industry are going to uh, evolve the microstructure and how that microstructure will uh, determine the final properties of that material. So this example is for an advanced gear steel, which I'll be talking about in our first case study of looking at kind of the key aspects of the material microstructure and how we want to control them both through the processing and the composition um, selection to yield our properties. So um, for a material design, this really gives us that first roadmap on how we go about doing it. Um, for the CalFAT approach, uh, which is fundamental to understanding that microstructure uh, for a Questec engineer, uh, this phase uh, step diagram really provides a lot of uh, very important information, both in terms of the impact of uh, material composition and also the processing on how that microstructure will evolve through um, its uh, industrial processes. What this is showing is uh, phase stability. So it's really a slice of a multi-component phase diagram uh, showing the phase stability at various temperatures. So this will inform the impact of uh, various uh, composition changes on phase stability such that we can design a material to yield desirable second phases in the material to either provide strengthening, uh, toughness, uh, corrosion resistance, et cetera, whatever the application is requiring, while avoiding uh, detrimental phases. Uh, key uh, process temperatures are shown here where uh, homogenization temperature, uh, some of the impacts where, for instance, this Thai um, NC carbide, we would want to homogenize while that is stable to avoid excessive grain growth. And then there's solution and aging temperature and very um, wealth of information that we can derive from this material. We can also use this information within a given spec range to understand how perturbations within an industry specification will alter these critical temperatures or uh, phase stability. So we're able to inform um, optim optimal uh, processing or uh, target uh, composition ranges within a given specification. So from that design, uh, we then want to look to understand how that microstructure is going to impact uh, mechanical or some sort of physical property. In this case, I'm going to show some experimental characterization and validation of the strengthening model that we employ in an M2C strengthened Martin Siddick steel. So in this case, uh, for the strengthening model, we know that uh, the critical particle size that is most optimal is at that transition from particle shearing to Aura 1 looping. So what we're able to do is design a composition such that the coarsening rate and phase fraction of this uh, secondary uh, precipitate is optimized for the desired processing. So here we're integrating 
uh, upstream processing to this uh, final uh, material state um, optimal uh, properties. And this uh, technique and these uh, particles have been now confirmed in um, multiple characterization methods where the black and white photos are uh, TEM images and the uh, illustrations are atom probe reconstructions. So really an atom by atom reconstruction of the material where the red phases are those um, M2C strengthening carbides. So in addition to the final state of understanding the material, we're able to use these techniques to optimize how we get there. So here I'm showing a process structure model of looking at um, solidification and homogenization modeling of a given material, where on the left are secondary dendrite arm spacing images from bar castings, which have different uh, spacing. From this experimental data and the uh, calculation, we're able to determine the uh, solidification segregation as a function of distance, which is shown in the middle plot. And then using kinetic simulations, we're able to understand how uh, this material will homogenize at uh, time and temperature. So as you can see that as um, the material is held at high temperature, uh, various elements start to homogenize, but yet we don't necessarily expect every element to reach its full homogenization state. And this is important to ensure that we're able to have usable material to get to that final desired state. In addition to kind of uh, guiding the final state, the material processing, we're also able to streamline and accelerate qualification of material. So really kind of looking at using ICME on now kind of this next order of magnitude, if you will, such that uh, rather than have to produce uh, seven heats or more to generate an A basis minima for mechanical or for whatever property, able to take data from three heats, run uh, the ICME uh, based uh, strength model and predict how var uh, variations within the material spec range will impact the uh, probabilistic of uh, mechanical properties. So rather than have to uh, use the seven heats, as I mentioned, do it in far fewer heats. So it's uh, reduced cost and reduced time to get to this uh, confidence interview interval on the mechanical properties. And this is important for where we wanna go into the future. And this is a, a concurrent engineering approach to look at a component and a material simultaneously such that uh, we can design both the uh, component and the material and use uh, iterative feedback from both design aspects to inform uh, the component and the material selection. And I can't think of a better example than additive manufacturing and where we can go to really highlight the benefits of this concurrent engineering approach. We're taking a generic example of an antenna bracket shown in the top here, where the original design goes uh, from something uh, joined out of uh, plate material to this topologically designed uh, material uh, design. Uh, really, we're now looking at incorporating some of these FEA or topology uh, optimization software in addition to this material design. But as we look at this design, the requirements for that material might be a little different than what people are accustomed to. So by kind of looking at material and a component together, we're able to look to get more optimized and better final components. An example of this is shown here on the right where this inner lattice uh, uh, structuring to yield lightweight and high performance, um, the material requirements here could be a little different than what we are accustomed to using. So with that, I'll transition towards uh, our approach to additive manufacturing development. So at Quest Tech right now, we're um, continuing to build this ICME toolkit for AM because um, with AM, things are a little bit different and unique to the thermal process and the solidification process history that this material sees. 
So we're looking to adapt existing alloys for AM processes. We're also designing new alloys that are tailored to additive manufacturing to really capture uh, the full benefit of this process. But as um, we all know, the additive manufacturing technology is rapidly developing as well. So we are looking at powder bed, binder jet, wire fed, uh, DED, all of these different uh, processes are, ha have their own unique benefits, but also their unique challenges. And I'll also mention the idea of functionally graded materials, where this is um, a very exciting topic that we're uh, working on now, looking at how specific uh, components can be tailored to have material in certain locations and understanding how that transition would occur. So just as Joe had mentioned, um, this is kind of that advanced next level of joining dissimilar materials. So with that, I'll uh, kick off our three case studies that really showcase how we're using ICME in additive manufacturing today. So we'll talk about ferrium C64, and then Dana will take over and talk about the 17.4 stainless and an Inconel 625 uh, modeling challenge uh, recently completed at Quest Tech. So with that, I'll uh, jump into case study number one, which I'm happy to say actually is really two ICME success stories in one. One, the development of the uh, wrought alloy that is uh, now um, going into use in applications today and, and in flight, and then also how we're adapting it to additive manufacturing. So by 2025, uh, a, the AGMA identified that the need for new materials was going to be um, inherent and necessary to continue uh, the evolution of designs. And I'll point to this picture on the right that really shows just the harshest environment one might expect for a, a helicopter where uh, a lot of impurity ingestion into the motor could lead to destruction of the gearbox, but also if uh, there was an oil out uh, condition here, the uh, gearbox might look to uh, fail. So this truly represents uh, next generation harshest condition possible. And this is where Questec developed Ferrium C64 to address that need. So this uh, is a grade of steel that is designed to get very high surface hardness, uh, Rockwell C up to 64, while maintaining good core strength, toughness, elongation. One of the keys of this uh, grade is its tempering temperature. A uh, 925F tempering temperature is higher than traditional uh, gear steels, and that's desirable for this uh, extended oil out survivability. By maintaining a stable microstructure, at these oil out temperatures that might be 400 degrees F that would degrade a typical gear steel. Uh, the ferrium C64 maintains its strength and its uh, structural integrity. And this has been borne out with the uh, FARDS uh, test gearbox where uh, ferrium C64 components survived 85 minutes of oil out uh, uh, operation without showing uh, significant damage. So with this, we've uh, determined that ferrium C64 is a desirable candidate for additive manufacturing to look into, as uh, Joe was saying, some of these applications that perhaps orphaned gear technology that uh, the components to make the existing gears no longer exist. So we're looking at how we can prove out additive manufacturing of C64. And as many of us are acutely aware, there are some barriers to this adoption that uh, we're uh, combining the use of experimental data with ICME approach to understand the variability, whether it be powder lot to powder lot or part to part or machine to machine to really uh, hone in on sources of that variability and minimize them. This is going to feed into our qualification, understanding the consistency, and really some of this is just a lack of data and experience in this additive uh, manufacturing. So through the use of ICME and this accelerated 
uh, qualification or insertion of materials aim. It really is offering a lower cost, more rapid solution to many of these barriers. So we have uh, currently uh, working on a project uh, that we continue to look at IC, uh, I'm sorry, AM of Barium C64. So we've had a number of uh, successful builds where we have optimized the uh, build parameters as well as the post-processing and taken them through what would be a traditional raw um, post-processing and are showing that uh, the AM versions are comparable to the raw version. So this is ongoing work, but we're uh, um, proving out that AM is a potential alternative source uh, to some of these raw alloys. And some of the most current work that uh, is ongoing is looking at the single tooth uh, bending fatigue of this material and taking through uh, taking single tooth bending uh, test samples through a gear manufacturing process that includes the carburization and appropriate surface finishing. We're looking at ways that we can uh, streamline this supply chain and really focus on the value proposition and the return on the investment to use additive manufacturing to get to that uh, final desired state uh, in the most efficient manner. So we're very optimistic on how C64 is transitioning from raw to additive manufacturing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dana who will take us through our next two case studies. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, so the first case study I'll talk about uh, is focused on the optimization of a high-performance stainless steel powder for additive manufacturing. Um, so on the next slide, there's a need for a best-in-class high-strength stainless steel powder for SLM or selective laser melting uh, powder bed AM uh, for applications in the defense, energy, and medical sectors, and others. This is driven by interest in lightweighting as well as enabling novel technologies and performance. Uh, particular for, particularly for naval aviation, there's interest in replacing small bushings, uh, control, and rotor parts. And uh, the Navy's already printed uh, parts such as the nacelle link for the V-22 engine, which are being qualified for aerospace. Um, the, in terms of performance, uh, there's the need to meet or exceed rot properties for the components they're looking to replace. Uh, there's also the need for excellent uh, reliability, which means low tolerance uh, for lot-to-lot -lot or sample-to-sample -sample variation. Uh, there's the need for both dimensional accuracy and good spatial resolution, which is enabled by the SLM powder bed process itself. Uh, and finally, there's a, a real interest in minimizing uh, post-processing, which is driven by the desire for cost and schedule savings. Uh, so the baseline material for this case study is 17.4 pH. This is a high-strength martensitic stainless steel, which is uh, copper precipitation strengthened. It's generally known not just for its high strength, but also its excellent fatigue and corrosion properties. So in designing a powder feedstock, we really have to consider all aspects of the AM process, going all the way uh, back to the powder production process itself, um, as well as aspects related to the powder, not just composition, but physical attributes, such as particle size distribution and morphology and other defects, which can um, uh, control uh, the flow properties of the powder and the, the quality of the AM build. Uh, we also have to look at the AM process specifications so that we can make sure we have a robust, uh, uh, highly dense defect-free build. And finally, we want to look at the post-process specification, which can involve anything from uh, the stress relief uh, heat treatment to hipping heat treatment, uh, other heat treatments, and uh, surface finishing. Um, so in particular, for 17.4 uh, powder feedstock for SLM, we know that uh, the quality and uh, uh, shape of the uh, powder feedstock is really critical in getting a high quality build. And generally, there, uh, this involves inert gas atomization uh, for feedstock production. And there are two main uh, types of uh, ga uh, gas atomized 17.4 feedstock available on the market. Uh, a nitrogen atomized uh, feedstock as well as argon atomized feedstock. And there's uh, real challenges in utilizing each of these powders and making sure that they're optimized for uh, AM of, of 17.4. And that's what I'll talk about in this case study. Um, so first, the problem with nitrogen atomized 17.4 powder is that 
uh, large amounts of nitrogen uh, during the atomization process can be incorporated into the powder, um, which can lead to high levels of retained austenite in the build, both in the as-built and stress relief condition, and can also lead to a variation in the resulting microstructure and properties of heat-treated material. So, so um, this means that uh, you know, we're not necessarily meeting uh, properties in these as-built and stress relief conditions, but getting a really wide range of properties and responses to solution heat treatment. So that's something that um, we were looking to address with this first uh, modeling approach. So on the next slide, uh, you can see how we've applied ICME models to look at equilibrium phase stability and the impact of nitrogen, in particular utilizing uh, thermal calc software and a CalFAD based approach here. Uh, on the left, you can see a uh, base 17-4 composition with relatively low levels of nitrogen, typical of argon atomized powder. On the right, you can see uh, the step diagram for 17-4 uh, with relatively high levels of nitrogen, typical of a nitrogen atomized powder. And there's a few key effects on the phase stability that can be seen here. Uh, the first is increased stability of the MX grain pinning dis dispersion, which is typically a niobium carbide uh, for these types of um, uh, alloys. Uh, we also see a significant uh, increase in stability of a chrome nitride phase at higher nitrogen levels, which actually uh, can encroach on the available solution heat treatment window. Uh, and finally, we see an increase in the austenite stability. That's this uh, purple line, which is the FCC phase here, uh, that goes hand in hand with a reduced stability of the high temperature BCC delta ferrite phase. Uh, so this is uh, a key impact we, we see from our equilibrium uh, step diagrams. So on the next slide, uh, you can see how we've also applied ICME models to model the austenite martin site stability by uh, applying Questex MS modeling approach. Uh, to model the MS temperature for an alloy, we take into account both the uh, critical driving force tra tra for transformation as well as the chemical driving force. Um, and we capture both the athermal and thermal terms. Uh, and you can see the predicted MS model in the bottom as the function of as a function of nitrogen content for typical nickel levels in 17.4. Uh, you can accommodate up to around 0.08 weight percent nitrogen before the MS temperature is sufficiently suppressed, such that we would not expect martensite to form on quenching. Um, so uh, what we can see is for higher levels of nitrogen, uh, such as those typical um, for nitrogen atomized uh, material, that we wouldn't expect. Uh, martensite to form without the uh, additional uh, uh, cryogenic uh, heat treatments at low temperatures to promote uh, isothermal uh, transformation of the martensite. So on the next slide, we've shown this experimentally. You can see for the argon atomized powder that we see uh, uh, an effect, not just of direct aging where we see a slight bump in hardness, but we see that it is capable of meeting rot properties after a solution heat treatment and H900 age. Um, however, for the nitrogen atomized powder, we see uh, little to no effect uh, with direct aging or solution heat treatment in aging. It's only after applying a full solution heat treatment, cryo, and H900 uh, post-process sequence that we can fully convert the martens uh, to martensite and achieve rock properties. So uh, what we've shown here is that by applying our ICME uh, modeling approaches, we are able to optimize the post-processing to achieve rock properties uh, for uh, which enables us to use a nitrogen atomized feedstock for these types of powders. Uh, however, as I mentioned earlier, there's real interest in uh, reducing uh, expensive post-processing, such as cryogenic treatments. So this really motivates our interest in uh, developing argon atomized powder feedstocks. Um, so uh, the problem with argon atomized powder feedstocks is the variability in the as printed microstructure and heat treatment response, even within the Arcon atomized 17.4 uh, powder spec. Um, so we've looked at a number of commercial powders, two of which are shown here um, uh, just for uh, comparison. And you can see that uh, the powder from supplier A when printed um, uh, shows a nearly fully martensitic microstructure. The powder from supplier B when printed shows a nearly fully retained delta ferrite martens, uh, sorry, a nearly fully uh, delta ferrite microstructure with very low levels of, of martensite. Um, and this uh, translates as well, not just to the, the as-built microstructure, but the properties that we observe, we see variation in the as-built properties. We see uh, while supplier A powder does show a direct uh, hardening response in the direct age condition, supplier B does not and needs to be fully uh, solution heat treated in age to meet rock properties. 
Um, so this tells us that not all 17-4 powders are created equal when it comes to use for AM, and that as an end user or OEM, which 17-4 powder you choose really matters. Um, and that uh, variation within the existing 17-4 spec can be a real uh, problem in uh, qualifying your AM process. So Questec has developed ICME models for, uh, that allow us to accurately predict as printed microstructure, including uh, the delta ferrite, martensite, and austenite that might be expected as a function of uh, composition. And we've used this to design two new powders uh, for AM for 17.4. One is our QT 17.4 powder, which was designed specifically for direct aging. This eliminates the need for a high temperature solution heat treatment. Um, and has the potential to combine with a low temp combine this low temperature aging step with the stress relief. Uh, our other design is our QT174 plus powder, which was designed to be used in the as printed condition, which eliminates the need for any post processing heat treatment. It'll be very interesting for use in expeditionary environments or other uh, situations where access to furnaces are limited. Um, so on the next slide, you can see that uh, the as-built microstructure of these two powder designs shows that we have achieved a majority martensite structure in the as-built condition. And in the following slide, you can see uh, the resulting tensile properties. In the as-built condition, both the QT174 and QT174 plus powder outperform the commercial competitor uh, for yield strength and elongation. We see some anisotropy in the as-built condition due to the inherently anisotropic weld pool microstructure uh, present in um, all uh, sort of as-built AM material. Uh, the QT174 powder uh, is uh, comparable in yield strength to the um, currently uh, available best-in-class commercial powder and um, uh, does exceed properties for elongation. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, ICME has enabled Questex design of uh, these optimized high-strength stainless steel AM feedstock alloys uh, with superior performance compared to uh, commercially available powders, uh, which really has the potential for significant cost savings by relaxing or, or eliminating post-processing requirements while still reliably meeting property targets. So in the, the final case study is focused on how Questex applied ICME models to effectively predict tensile properties for AM Nickel 625 as part of the Air Force Research Lab AM challenge earlier this year. Uh, this is a really good example of how we can leverage ICME modeling to produce highly accurate results with really minimal calibration data. So the complexity of the AM process along with uh, the dependence of properties on process history and part geometry can lead to a variation in properties that aren't really well captured by existing modeling approaches. Um, qualification of AM components requires the ability to predict uh, properties with a high degree of certainty, but gathering extensive experimental data sets is expensive and time consuming, further underscoring the need for predictive location specific models that can account for microstructural variations arising from location, process history, and other features um, of complex AM builds. So the AFRL challenge sought modeling approaches that could be applied uh, to a limited set of AM Inconel 625 calibration data to predict the tensile behavior across a number of processing conditions, uh, including uh, orientation, thickness, surface finish, and uh, post-processing. So you can see uh, the inputs that were provided as part of the challenge, including limited calibration uh, tensile data at uh, room temperature and elevated temperature. And the desired modeling outputs included uh, tensile properties such as uh, modulus, yield strength, UTS, uh, uniform elongation, and strain hardening behavior for all uh, samples at ambient and elevated temperatures. So on the next slide, uh, Questec utilized a mechanistic modeling approach uh, in which tensile properties are predicted based on key microstructural features governing these properties, um, including aspects of the microstructure such as uh, precipitation and uh, solid, solid solution strengthening, as well as aspects of the, the grain structure, such as grain size and uh, texture orientation. Uh, the contribution from those uh, features shaded in blue uh, were det was determined um, based on calibration tensile data, and the contribution from those shaded in green uh, was determined from the EBSD data. So on the next slide, we just have some more details about the, the strength models utilized. Um, the strength models uh, included uh, terms for the base strength of the alloys, the Hall patch contribution, 
um, and the contribution from other microstructural features such as the solid uh, solution and precipitation strengthening. And these were scaled to M, which is the Taylor factor, which captures the grain orientation uh, dependence. So on the next slide, uh, just shows how we calculated the Taylor factor from the EBSD maps provided as part of the challenge. And this really captured um, both the controlled uh, AM parameters such as the build orientation and thickness, as well as any uncontrolled sample to sample variation. So on the next slide, uh, this shows the summary and results. Um, uh, on the right side, you can see the results for the model predictions. Uh, in black and red are the room temperature tensile response and in uh, blue and green would be the high temperature response for both the stress relieved samples as well as the stress relieved HIPT and heat treated samples. And you can see that our models predict variation within each sample set uh, and that accounts for the microstructural variation as a function of uh, orientation and part thickness. Um, so in conclusion, we utilized microstructure based uh, yield strength models uh, calibrated to the provided data uh, in addition to uh, using EBSD data to account for the effect of grain structure variation between samples. Uh, to accurately predict the tensile response of these Inconel 625 samples. And as I said, we were uh, uh, selected as the winner of this challenge uh, due to the high fidelity of our predictions compared to the experimental results. So um, a key reason that Questech was successful in this AR AFRL challenge um, was that this is already the approach we're taking in modeling AM properties. Uh, Questech's developing software that focuses on accelerated qualification and certification of AM parts and processes uh, by applying location-specific predictive models across AM material classes. Uh, the typical trial and error approach uh, for process design is time-consuming and expensive, and process qualification even more so due to the large amount of data that's typically required uh, in order to avoid uh, additional design iterations. So this AQC software framework will allow for fewer design iterations and less data needed for qualification through full integration of the design and qualification process, thus bringing the value of the ICME approach to the AM marketplace. All right, with that, um, I thank you and uh, happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, now you guys uh, can see why we enjoy having uh, Quest Tech as a member of the Institute. So I uh, encourage you to uh, take a look at, uh, at their website, follow up with them um, directly. If you have any questions, I uh, would love to, uh, to, to see that interaction. In the meantime, uh, if you have any questions, please use the chat function. We can certainly uh, address those questions in the time we have, uh, we have left. There were a few questions that came up one or two were already addressed because you guys were already on it, but maybe for the group. Um, can you talk about the work uh, Questech has done with non-ferrous alloys, particularly aluminum uh, alloys that don't have uh, phase diagrams? I know Jeff kind of answered that in the chat, but if you can explain, expound on that a little bit more. Well, sure, I'll start and I'll uh, say that uh, right now we have a number of projects ongoing that are developing new aluminum uh, alloys for additive manufacturing. Uh, this was born, uh, one of them was born out of the kind of understood that uh, 6061 and other existing wrought alloys uh, show a lot of solidification cracking during builds. So we've looked at ways to uh, develop these high strength aluminum alloys for um, additive manufacturing. Uh, previously, we've also looked at uh, alloy designs for cast applications and opportunities. Uh, we're looking at uh, some now as well, looking at how uh, we can use ICME to look at new uh, cast aluminum alloys as well. Yeah, and I'll also make a comment regarding the, the phase diagram question. Um, you know, Questech has a number of, uh, uh, our approach utilizes a CalFab-based approach. In particular, we, we work very closely with uh, ThermalCalc, and uh, ThermalCalc has a number of really great, uh, robust uh, databases, including for aluminum, that has, have really been built out to cover uh, a large uh, range of, of chemistries uh, relevant to aluminum alloy systems. 
uh, you know, Questech also has uh, proprietary databases that we use from time to time, but uh, when it comes to aluminum, uh, ThermoCalc has, has very comprehensive databases available. Um, so uh, we, we haven't quite run up against the, the situation where um, we, we don't have access to any uh, phase data to, to guide our designs. All right, awesome. Um, two, uh, two other questions uh, related to the N2 discussion that was going on. First was, um, uh, I think it was already, this may have already been answered, but, but can it be replaced with argon in the atomization of the 17 uh, dash four pH and uh, uh, or and would would uh, would the addition um, would it be would it tie up the N two at all? Um, yeah, I can answer that question. Um, yes, yeah, so I think uh, we we did get to this argon atomization uh, approach eventually. So I think we. Um, we answered that part of the question. Uh, <laughs> we have also considered um, the addition of, of titanium to tie up nitrogen. Uh, this would work partially, of course, the amount of nitrogen present in these nitrogen atomized uh, uh, powders is uh, orders of magnitude higher than that in the uh, typical uh, specification for 17.4. So it would work to an extent, but we, we'd be limited by the amount, uh, the, the phase fraction of resulting tie nitrides that we'd want to produce, as well as any potential uh, detriments to uh, properties like elongation and toughness that could arise by over stabilizing a tie nitrate phase. Oh, yeah, you did uh, tackle a couple of those. Uh, again, if you do have any more questions, please uh, please use the chat function. I have about, uh, about five minutes left before we want to be sensitive to folks, uh, to folks' time. So, uh, so please um, uh, shoot them out while you can. If, if you, if you uh, would like to follow up afterwards, you're more than welcome to do that uh, as well. Another uh, question that uh, that just came in is: Would you be able to do work on uh, PT-based uh, for high temperature applications? Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. We work across a number of uh, novel alloy systems. Um, I think we gave some examples just about our work in, in steels and nickels, uh, nickel alloys uh, today. But we work um, on. Uh, aluminum, titanium, copper alloys, uh, precious metals, or refractories, HEAs. So we, we have quite a bit of experience across uh, different alloy classes um, and would also be able to apply ICME to platinum-based alloys. Uh, in addition to platinum, you know, we're doing a lot of work in other uh, high temperature or extreme environment material systems, including refractories, uh, refractory HEAs, and even uh, ceramic systems. All right, excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know that we have any more questions that have come in, but again, uh, if you'd like to follow up with Questec, their information is on the screen. Uh, again, this uh, webinar will be, uh, has been recorded and will be available uh, for future viewing if you want to follow up uh, that way as well. And again, I encourage you to uh, visit lift.technology to, uh, to take a look at our, uh, our uh, facility and our, um, and our high bay and uh, take a look and follow us on uh, LinkedIn and, and Twitter as well. So with that, I want to thank everyone for, uh, for joining. Uh, I want to thank, uh, thank the Quest Tech team for an awesome presentation and their awesome partnership with Lyft. We certainly appreciate that. And, um, and we look forward to, uh, to our next uh, webinar session. So stay tuned to your emails and our website for that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I hope everyone uh, has a great afternoon and we will talk into you soon. Thank you very much.